Um, we are going to move on to uh, Professor Trisha McCabe, who obviously is the uh, head of discipline in speech pathology and uh, works in the area of um, childhood speech disorders. And she is going to talk to us today about bridging the evidence-based practice gap and how do we research clinical treatments. So we move over to Trisha, who's our last one for the day, for this session. Thank you, Kiri. Um, so this paper doesn't have any data in it, or a tiny bit. What I'm trying to do here is start a conversation about um, a problem that um, we need to think about as a profession and as a discipline um, of how we resolve this issue. So um, many of you will be very aware of the idea of evidence, E3BP. So this is evidence-based practice where we balance the research evidence and we look at for the highest available, somebody's not muted, would you mind? Um, we look for the highest available research evidence. So we look for a meta-analysis, or if not that, then more than one randomized control trial showing that the treatment works. So we've got that kind of research evidence. We've got practice-based evidence, which is what we used to call clinical evidence, but now we call practice-based evidence. And that's clinical data, it's clinical experience, and it's an understanding of who you work with, what your population is, and how close your population is to what the research evidence is. And then finally, we have in what in the literature is called informed patient consent, but it's actually about our patients, consumers, or clients having autonomy and having um, say in the a fully informed um, decision making and. I'm not sure whether we do a great job of that, of presenting all the options. Um, what we primarily do, and I, I'm as guilty of this as the next person, is we primarily give um, a limited range of options based on the practice-based evidence and the research evidence. Now, as a philosophy, this is a great one and assumes that we um, are doing this on a regular basis, if not daily. Um, however, we've got there's an elephant in the room. And if we think of this, see this picture, we've got these three white balls on one side um, balanced on each other and on the board, um, but there's this big blue ball on the left-hand side. And that big blue ball is who pays because the payer um, determines much of what we're allowed to do. And many of you being in the NDIS um, system, um, will know that there are things that um, are outside what uh, the NDIS will pay for. For those of you who are international, you'll be very aware of insurance companies. Um, and for those of you who are around Australia, not New South Wales, but elsewhere around the country, you'll be aware that school policy um, determines who we see, what we, what we do and how we do it. There's a growing demand from the funding agencies that they want research evidence. And that causes us a problem as a profession because many of our treatments don't have good research evidence. So I just want to talk about that for a minute. And then we're going to look at um, flipping it and seeing how we turn practice-based evidence into research evidence. So um, I think both Lynn and Nicola talked about, uh, in fact, Mary Ann, Lynn and Nicola all talked about phases of treatment research. And Lynn mentioned the Fay and Feinstack um, model, uh, Roby before them um, and Rogers as well. We talk about different phases of treatment research. We have phase one where we try and work out what it is we're doing. And this might only be one or two participants. We have phase two where we show that the treatment is viable, that we can get a treatment effect um, but we don't know whether that treatment effect applies to everybody. Phase three is where we start doing larger studies and comparing the child to themselves. So we do um, single case experimental design with good control, or we start doing randomized control trials where we look at, is this treatment better than no treatment or is this treatment better than the gold standard treatment? And this gives us an effect size, which um, Lynn was just talking about, um, and tells us how many people we would have to look at to know that this treatment is generally effective. That's our phase four studies, later efficacy. And they, they need to be large numbers of 
um, participants in what we're talking about today, large numbers of children. And then finally, we do effectiveness studies. And effectiveness studies is where the treatment goes out in the real world and we measure the real world impact. There aren't many speech pathology interventions that have effectiveness studies. The three that I can think of at this stage are the Lidcom program in stuttering, the um, Lee Silverman um, voice treatment in Park for Parkinson's disease and the Hannon program uh, for child language. But the rest of all of our other treatments are not at that level. It's a problem because unless we get multiple phase four studies, it's very difficult to do a meta-analysis and provide overall Cochrane systematic review level evidence that says this is the thing you should do. And that's what the researchers want. And anytime you interact with, not the researchers, that's what the funders want. And anytime you interact with the medical system, that's what they want. So we've got a bit of a problem. And that problem comes from a number of sources. I wanna focus in on one in particular. Ah, oh, before I do that. Um, so as many of you know, we've developed rapid syllable uh, transition treatment or REST um, at the University of Sydney, starting with a unpublished conference presentation where we piloted it with seven kids, moving on to Kiri's um, uh, first published paper about rest, which was three um, siblings in 2010, and then a whole series of phase two studies, Donna Thomas um, having three of those, me having one, Ilaria Scarcella most recently having a study in Italian. We've done, we've got one published randomised control trial, which is one more than every other treatment except for the Nuffield program. Um, and just today, for the first time, we have independent replication. So there are other people doing work on rest, and sometimes they include one of us, so that's not independent. Today, just in my inbox, um, there's a Korean replication of um, replication study, it's a phase two study. So we don't have phase three um, replication, but we do have independent replication. So when, when we started this, this was a clinical good idea from Don Robin, and we applied a whole lot of theory to it, and we've tested it through phases one to three. And as I said, today we get uh, 15 years after we first started doing this week, we've this work, we've got our first independent replication, which is a coincidence, but it's something I'm celebrating. Compare that to the Nuffield program. Now, many of you will know the Nuffield, and as Mary Ann said, it is the most commonly used um, apraxia treatment in Australia. But let's compare it. That started in the 1970s at the Royal National Throat and Ear Hospital in London in the Nuffield Clinic there. Nuffield, it's called Nuffield because that's a big philanthropic organisation who funded lots of things in the UK. It's not the person Nuffield, it's the centre Nuffield. Um, and it, it was published as a clinical resource in 1985. And, and um, they're up to the third slash fourth edition, depending on whether you have the paper-based version or the electronic version. But most recently um, review, re revised in 2012. Um, so it's widely used in the UK and Australia, hardly used at all outside of the Commonwealth countries. But even though it was developed all those years ago, the first time there was a publication about the Nuffield program was when Liz Murray's PhD paper, we published a randomised control trial comparing REST to Nuffield. So we've got a problem here. This is a widely used program but it's hardly been evaluated. Now, more research has come out since then, but it highlights the dilemma. Stuff that is widely used is hardly researched. That's what Mary Ann's PhD was about, the Kaufman program, widely used in the US, hardly researched. And so this is, this is challenging. So let's think about how we research the, good, the clinical good idea. So our clinical evidence, we have a great idea. We make our own resources and then we publish those materials. We might share them with our workmates. We might um, 
put them on teachers pay teachers we might um put them on a website and sell them to people we might actually publish them as a book and that's really great sharing of clinical good idea but it's not research evidence even if you publish the Nuffield program as a program it's not research evidence and so we end up with this oops now we're stuck so in an ideal situation what happens is we do that but we also present it at conferences and maybe we do QI projects evaluating our own performance and maybe we try and publish that and that's good as well but then we need to go well what else do we need to do to get this to be research evidence because that's not research evidence either so most clinicians take it as far as a conference presentation it's a way to get your boss to pay for you to go to a conference it's a way for you to learn about other people's good research ideas and it's a way to um, develop your own ideas and so forth because when you share your materials you get feedback and so you get to improve them so if we were to think about it i what mostly happens to me is somebody has a great idea they develop their resources they might do a qi project and a conference presentation they might share their materials and then they'll come and say oh we've done all this work would you like to evaluate it and I'll say, of course I would. That would be delightful. Or um, they might try and write it up themselves. And that would be fabulous as well. Um, and no doubt when you're undergraduate students or doing your master's degree, people said, oh, yes, clinicians should do research and so forth. But we get to this point and we go, well, what do we do now? There's another problem. And that is the other, the, the other issue here is that you can't take something that's designed for clinical purposes and turn it into a research project because a research project has to have boundaries. And just as we were talking about in the systematic reviews about what um, clinicians, uh, what the researchers do um, and do they publish the dose and do they publish the effect sizes and so forth. All of these things need to be built in to the collecting of the data. And even before that, they need to be built into how you do the treatment. So when we looked at the Nuffield program, well, truthfully, Liz and I looked at it and we went, oh, we've been doing it wrong all these years because we hadn't read the manual. We had just used the materials. And so we read the manual and then we had to try and turn the Nuffield manual into a clinical procedure that everybody would follow the same. And that's difficult in clinical practice because of practice-based evidence, our experience and modifying for our, our clients and participants. So changing tack a little bit, let's say you've got a clinical good idea and you want to um, publish it so that it becomes research evidence. So superficially, this is what happens in the research process. We have an idea. If we're lucky, we get some funding. Maybe we do, maybe we don't. We do some research saying this is what we're going to do. This is what we've done. This is what the results mean. We write the paper and then we submit it to be published. Now, the researchers in the audience are going and. So let's have a look at the and. What happens after you publish it? after you submit it to be published? Well, you submit the paper and it gets, if you're lucky, it gets sent out to your peers to read it and review it and critique it. And the purpose of this is to improve it and to make sure that the science is as good as it could be. So we want to improve the science. So a review happens. And that review gets sent back to you. And if you're lucky, you get asked to revise and resubmit. You get asked to do it again. And so you submit that and you get asked to review it. And this circle can go round and round and round. The very smartest, the very luckiest of the researchers get their paper accepted after one review. But it rarely, rarely happens. And quite often it can be three. And even at that point, you've put in three different revisions, it can be rejected. And this is shocking. 
this is shocking that you might go through three rounds of trying to appease the please and appease the reviewers and reviewer one might have said one thing and then reviewer one doesn't come back in in round two or round three and reviewer four says do the exact opposite and so you've had this dance with the reviewers um, over many, many iterations. Well, for the clinician doing this, that rejection is catastrophic because almost always they've stuck their neck out to try and write the paper. They've stuck their neck out to um, deal with the reviewer's comments and some reviewers are not kind. Um, and they've you know, invested a lot of time in this. And in fact, Kate Short and I have just had a, a previous honours student say, I can't do this anymore. If you want this published, you're going to have to do it yourself. Rejection is really hard. And it doesn't happen to every paper, but sometimes it does happen. There's a nice bit of research that says papers that get rejected are often more highly cited than papers get that get initially um, accepted. So I hold on to that bit. Why am I telling you about this? Because if you're the clinician thinking this is what the process is, and you come to this being the process, then we've got a real big problem. So how can we fix this? Well, here's what I think we can do. Um, I think we can have a great idea and we can develop the idea clinically, but at the next step is that we think about the data we're collecting and how we standardise that data for everyone who's having this, who's working in this clinical good idea. And then you turn it into a QI or a research project and you do conference presentations. And then the conference presentation, just as I've had to do today to work out my ideas and sequence them, that feeds into a publication but, oops, but what else could we do? So I think we need to be partners. And so what I would like to, to suggest to you all is come to our um, interaction in the next section, talk to the researchers you've, you've talked to today, uh, you've heard today and the others, but when you've got a clinical good idea, that is the time to talk to the researchers because A, you're not wasting our time, B, you're not um, wasting your own time. And C, we get brownie points from our employers for, for working with you. So I know that's a bit of a, a pep talk at the end, but publication is easier if, we, if you get researchers involved in your um, QI projects very early on. And I'd be interested in having a discussion with you about what else we can do because these are ideas I'm now forming. I want to finish off by sharing um, some photos of our new building. So here we have Mary Ann sitting in a meeting with me um, up exactly where Andy's um, background is. Um, we have the waiting area of our new clinic in the middle, and we have one of our new teaching spaces with Donna, uh, Donna Thomas teaching our uh, master's students. So uh, thank you. And um, that is the end with a minute to spare. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you so much, Tricia. Um, and so we are right on time. We do have a couple of minutes for questions if anyone does have a question for Tricia. Um, but also that was a great segue, Tricia, into um, come along to the Toucan uh, chat sessions as well. And remember the, um, the links to those are in the chat box. But if anyone has any questions or for any of the speakers, um, please go ahead. Um, and we have a comment. It looks so nice. Hopefully we can come and visit one day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we wish. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, I, oh, so Nat Munro has put a, a comment up. Um, standardization of data is such an important topic in pediatric speech and language research and practice. Tricia, what are your thoughts about how to achieve this? I think, I think if you standardize in your setting, um, what you do with every child who has this disorder, so that we're going to um, 
we're going to, with every child who has a speech impairment, we're going to do the DEEP and we're all going to do this subtest of the DEEP. And so we're not asking you to correct, collect, I'm not suggesting you collect extra data, but if in your individual workplace you all collect the same data, then you can compare across um, clinicians and you can talk about, well, as we're all using in our field or the rest, this is um, what what our findings are. And that makes for a great QI project. Um, you, if, for those of you who work in larger systems, then doing that across the system, doing it across the local health district, for example. I know New South Wales Health Paediatric Speech Pathology leaders have been talking for some time now about some standardised data collection um, across paediatric um, practice in New South Wales Health. And I think that's the kind of thing that will allow clinical research from what is real practice. So those phase five studies and also proving your clinical good idea is a good idea and could be used effectively. Um, so, um, and I've just had a, an individual question here about we don't have sufficient participants for statistical power, but that if everyone's collecting using the same protocol, then we can pull the data. And so I think that's um, standardising in your site, standard, standardising across sites um, is going to help that problem. Um, yes, and it's made the comment that it's um, possible to develop local norms when the data are standardised. So lots of things that we think, well, Australian kids don't do that, but we don't have Australian norms for them. So. Great. Um, I think one, one other question was, um, uh, how can we facilitate professional industry collaboration and funding with researchers? <laughs> the, the golden question. Yeah, uh, thank you, Jenny. Uh, great question. Um, I think I think it's, it's a two way, you've got to find the right partner. So um, you've got to find somebody who, you know, um, I'm currently doing a course on um, uh, lobbying and policy briefing and so forth. And you've got to have a relationship that is a positive and encouraging relationship in both directions. And that might take time. So it might take um, many, many iterations of meetings. For the academics, that's going out and being part of the team and hearing how things are going. For the clinicians, it's not, you know, not being discouraged on the first um, attempt. Um, and so, you know, we, we need to support each other. Um, yeah. Okay, we should wrap up uh, because um, the other sessions will be um, beginning soon. But thank you very much, Tricia, and thank you for all the speakers today. And I'm sure they welcome um, continued discussion uh, in the chat rooms or through email. Okay, thank you so much. All right. Bye.